All rise. Court is now in session. The Honorable Justice Hess, Justice Nancy, Justice Powers, and Justice Verity presiding. Counsel, you may approach. Hey, please support. Good afternoon. I'm Paula Copain, and I represent the appellate, Ms. Lamb, in this action. I'd like to reserve five minutes for the rest. Ms. Lamb brings this action against General Mills for misbranding of their products, fruit roll-ups and fruit by the foot. And I want to enter in Exhibit 1, which has already been entered. Misbranding under the uh, Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, U.S. 21, Section 343A, is labeling which has is which is either false or misleading in any particular or material fact. On these products, both the fruit roll-ups and fruit by the foot, which are the two products in question, the front of the labeling has fruit in the name, has strawberries on top, fruit in the name, but yet The content, when you look on the uh, side panel, which in real life, this is the box, this is the size of the front, the, side, the size of the printing on the back. The first ingredient is pear concentrate. Now while pear is a fruit, pear is not strawberry. So counselor, are you intending that the labeling is false or it is misleading? Technically, Your Honor, under the, the law, it's technically not false because pear concentrate is a fruit. It says made with real fruit and it is a fruit. But under the spirit of the law, it is misleading to the consumer because you're looking at the big labeling on the packaging, it, it depicts strawberries, it depicts fruit roll up in the name, it has made with real fruit, a reasonable consumer is going to make that connection that it's that it's real fruit. Counselor, what test are you asking us to use in determining? Well, actually, Your Honor, the Ninth Circuit in another case, Gerber versus uh, Williams versus Gerber, had a reasonable consumer standard, and this case was similar in that what the plaintiff brought was it was a fruit juice snack made especially for toddlers. A little difficult to see in this depiction, but it depicts fresh fruit mixed in with the snack. And then once again, it says fruit juice snack. On this side, the first ingredients, corn syrup, white grape juice. Grapes are not depicted at all. The Ninth Circuit used what they called the reasonable consumer standard. And using this standard, they said that a consumer doesn't need to go to the side of the packaging, that what's in boldface on the front is enough for them to make a reasonable decision what's in the product. But actually, Your Honor, I'm not asking the court to even use that reasonable consumer standard. What I'm asking the court to do is to go beyond that standard. I'm asking the court to go to the spirit of this, of this law. The FDCA is a public protection statute. It was made to protect consumers. Counselor, are you asking us to use a subjective standard or a least uh, sophisticated consumer standard if you don't want us to use a reasonable consumer standard? I'm asking you to go beyond it and actually use a standard to something even less than a reasonable consumer, the people that need protection the most, the unwary, the gullible, the less educated consumer, people that are are more deceived by this type of advertising. I'm asking the court to do what California has done traditionally in the past and be legally innovative. The FDA is trying to get some package, front of package labeling initiatives in place in response to the problem of childhood obesity, which is on the rise. The Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta has says that childhood obesity has tripled in the past 30 years. Okay, childhood obesity 
leads to many, many risk factors, okay? O obese youths become obese adolescents and obese adults. They have their high risk for diabetes, heart disease, and even certain types of cancer. FDA rule promulgation takes time. Changing laws takes time. Congress has typically amended this, the FDCA to broaden protection to unwary consumers. But it takes time. The FDA in its initiative for front of package labeling wants to put the same size nutritional labeling that's on the side of these packages along with the big labeling that's on the front so that a consumer, a Harry parent walking down an aisle in a grocery store has everything they need right in front of them to make a choice for their child. And these types of products are aimed at children. Okay, I think we can all agree. It's bright packaging, it's the, the commercial advertisements. General Mills targets children as the consumer for this product. But parents buy for the children. Counselor, would you say there's anything ambiguous or unambiguous about the, about the product label, the front cover? Yes. The ambi ambiguity comes from the depiction of the, the fruit, the strawberries, when there are no strawberries actually inside the fruit. No, Counselor, what I'm asking is mm -hmm. that when you look at that, when you look at the cover, is there any ambiguity? Do you assume that you're getting strawberries when you purchase that product? Yes. Or some strawberry derivative, something that at least contains uh, a derivative of the fruit, some substance of strawberries, has none. Pear concentrate is the first product. The rest is the first ingredient. The rest of the ingredients are mainly sugar and some fat. Is it not reasonable for consumers to believe that in today's day and age, pro food products are made with artificial flavorings that are not necessarily derived entirely from strawberries? Your Honor, it's not unreasonable to believe that, but when you label a product made with real fruit and you show a depiction of strawberries, I think in the same sense it's re reasonable to believe that there are some strawberries in that, in that product. Counsel, you keep on using the word reasonable, but you don't want us to use a reasonable consumer standard. I want you to go to beyond. A reasonable consumer is so, what the, I, I suppose the average person would believe when they're walking down the grocery aisle. I want you to go and think beyond oh, an educated mom, beyond an educated parent. I want you to go beyond and think of a parent with a child in a shopping cart who's harried, who's busy, who maybe is less educated and gullible and is trying to do the best for their child, sees this product, gives in to the whining because they say, okay, strawberries, fruit, it's, it's relatively okay. That's what I'm asking the court to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Counsel. May it please the court, my name is Samuel Spado. I'm here representing General Mills in this action, and I'd like to reserve five minutes of time for rebuttal. Your Honors, we're here today to ask you to affirm the lower court's decision that the labeling in question is not deceptive under federal law. And we believe this for three reasons. Number one, General Mills complies with the requirements for labeling as promulgated under the FDA. Number two, the reasonable person standard which plaintiff asks you to adopt is inappropriate in this case. And number three, plaintiff is really advancing a policy argument here. She's questioning the wisdom of the rules and regulations that are promulgated under the FDA, and that's best left for the legislator, not the judicial branch. And I'll address each of those issues in turn. Number one, labeling as it's required under the FDA requires not just the front of the package, but all sides of it. 
And I'm going to refer to what's been already admitted as P1 as evidence. What plaintiff would ask you to do is to stop at the front of the packaging. The front of the packaging isn't the label. The label contains all sides of the box. That's six sides. There's a lot of information that the FDA requires General Mills and manufacturers like them to put on the packaging. And as you can see from P1, there are references to strawberries, but it's qualified. It says made with real fruit. It doesn't say made with real strawberries. And so what plaintiff is asking you to do, in order for her argument to work, to get to your justice's point about whether it's reasonable for the person to seek out that information, she's saying it is too much for the average consumer to do this, to turn the wrist. Counselor, why would they turn their wrist if it says strawberries? Why would I assume it's anything other than strawberries? Because it doesn't say strawberries, Your Honor, respectfully. It says strawberry flavored. The FDA has said that when you have an ingredient that is an identifiable characteristic, in this case the flavor strawberry, that you have to qualify that by the word flavored if, in fact, you don't have strawberry in Counsel your product. Counselor, should, a reasonable, or should any consumer be, have the nuances of the English language of what the FDA says? I mean, a person is getting, going in, they're, they're looking at the box, it says strawberries. What, why else would they look at the ingredients? There's no reason for them to look at the ingredients. Your Honor, two points to that. First, if there was no reason to look at the ingredients, that makes all of the FDA rules and promulgations about labeling superfluous. They wouldn't exist. You would be taking effect away from the statute. And plaintiff is absolutely correct that the FDA is here for consumer protection. That's why they put the labeling initiatives and label, uh, labeling requirements there in the first place. So I would disagree that it, it isn't something that a consumer should be looking at. And second of all, there is a basic understanding that one should have of the English language, and it goes to your point about whether or not this reasonable consumer standard or whatever the plaintiff has labeled it is objective or subjective. And overwhelmingly, a reasonable consumer or reasonable person standard is often objective. In other words, the court asks itself not what the average person would do, but what a reasonable, objective person would do in a situation. Subjectively, I would have to agree with Your Honor that if somebody sees the word strawberry, whether or not it's got a qualifier after it, that there is an expectation that there are strawberries in there. However, objectively speaking, if there is a word that's qualified, in this case strawberry flavored, Understanding regular grammar, one would expect that that doesn't necessarily mean that there's strawberry in there. And I realize that may be a bit counterintuitive, and so does the FDA. And that's why the FDA requires that the ingredients be listed on the box. So, Counselor, are you saying, uh, you said that the reasonable person <coughs> standard you don't find appropriate. What would you find appropriate? That is a fair question, and I think that question is best answered in a legislative context. And I'll use that as an example. Council has referred to the FDA's front of packaging initiative. And I'm going to refer you to what's, again, already been admitted into evidence as D5. That's an example, Your Honors, of what the FDA thus far has suggested should be on the front of the package. If, in fact, we're trying to help the consumer make an informed decision, let's make it as easy as possible. Perhaps there is some value in not seeking out what exactly is in the box. And what you'll notice, Your Honors, is that there are several things there, six particular data entries, if you will, on the front of the package, and none of them relate to what the product is made of. It refers to the nutritional value, the quantitative objective value of the food item. Because you'll see, Your Honors, we could have presented many evidences, monumental amounts of studies and data that counteracts one policy over the other as it relates to the quality of a food item. And General Mills doesn't believe that that argument or debate shouldn't happen. It certainly should happen. It's part of an issue, as counsel rightfully pointed to, that there is childhood obesity and other health-related issues. And it certainly is important that we have quality food in this country. However, there's a difference between legislatively tackling that and trying to question the legal sufficiency of the rules and regulations that were properly enacted by the Food and Drug Administration under the APA. And as further uh, information in regards to that, and forgive me for a moment because there's quite a few exhibits here, what I'd like to do is real quick direct your attention to what's been marked as D2. And D2, we have two food items up here. One is 100% organic orange juice, the other is a can of soda. 
I think it would be remiss if I said that anybody would stand in this courtroom and say that a can of soda is healthy, whatever healthy means. But what you'll see, Your Honors, is that the nutritional content, the quantifiable data that one can put on their food product as promulgated by the FDA, is strikingly similar to the orange juice as far as sugar content, as far as the calories. Now, I'm not suggesting that a can of soda in a health sense whatever again that means, is just as good as orange juice. But there are plenty of doctors who will tell you that if you have a steady diet of juice, whether it's 100% organic orange juice or juice from concentrate, it's not going to be healthy for you. Counselor, now I understand your argument that um, change should best be left to the legislature, but now that you bring up the issue of the juice, how do you um, distinguish the Gerber case from, from uh, your argument? The Gerber case, Your Honor, dealt with a situation where there was a quantity of juice that one might reasonably expect. In other words, an amount of product, not whether or not it existed in the product at all. And there actually has been amendments to the uh, FDA rules and regulations as it relates to juice percentages. So in the Gerber case, and I'll bring up P3 so everybody knows what we're talking about here. In the Gerber case, you see nothing on the nutritional side here with the exception of this 2% or less of the following, that's related to vitamins that they have to add to the product. It has no quantification for the amount of juices that are in there. And so there was no qualifying language on the front of the cover that would suggest to a consumer there's anything in there but juice. Again, the FDA has changed its regulations since that time, and you have to put on there whether or not it's 100% juice, 5% juice, 10% juice. The FDA has not gone as far as to say that you must put down exactly what type of juice there is on the front of the package. Again, that is because there's a lot of information that exists out there to make an informed decision, and the FDA has required a manufacturer to use all sides of their box. So are you saying for the carton of orange juice, if it was orange juice and it had a picture of a cherry on it or a strawberry, you're saying that would not mislead a consumer? Absolutely, Your Honor, and here's why. The only way plaintiff's argument works is if you bifurcate strawberry from strawberry flavor. What the package says in this case is that you will have a product that when you put in your mouth, if your eyes were closed, you'd identify it as strawberry. We've lived up to that claim. Counselor, you cite a bruzi versus pasta and cheese as the appropriate standard. Who were the parties in, um, in that case? Just for point of clarification, I don't necessarily believe that is the appropriate standard. I just meant that to be an example that there is something further than uh, you, you have to look deeper into to define what a, a reasonable person is because in that case specifically, the justice says since consumers recognize that milk is nearly always pasteurized, you could use the word fresh. That was merely there as an example. But the parties in that case were two commercial enterprises. It wasn't a consumer. That is correct, and in that case, the one consumer party, and I see where your justice is going, that one party who was a consumer, uh, excuse me, a commercial party, was essentially saying that you're going to mislead customers into thinking your product is better, and they're going to want to take yours over mine. So it's analogous to the situation here. It all comes down to, I want to attract the consumer to my product because of what's on the front of the packaging. And what Abruzzi stands for is it's not just the front of the packaging, it's the entire package. It's the entire six sides, Your Honor. I have 20 seconds. That's all that I have. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Your Honor, General Mills is assuming that the consumers, or all consumers, or a reasonable consumer, any consumer, has basic understanding of the English language. Not all consumers do. Some consumers are fully educated. Maybe they don't understand. The words in conjunction with the pictures on the labeling is what depicts the prize that's inside. To have to, it's not a question of taking the time to turn the package around to look at the ingredients. It's a question of looking at the front of a package and um, using General Mills using marketing tools that depict fruit, actual fruit, with the words fruit to lead the consumer where they want to go. No one, General Mills says that no one would consider a can of soda a healthy snack, but the can of so Coca-Cola that we have here doesn't say made from real fruit. It doesn't say that it's made from anything 
that can be associated with something being healthy. It's Coca-Cola. The FDA initiative to put labeling on the front, while it may not list every ingredient on the front of the package, does list the sodium content, the fat content, and the calories. If someone were to see a fruit snack that has um, and bear with me because I'm taking a little liberty here, 400 calories per snack, they might then say, wait a minute, I'm going to look at the rest of this because there's something in there other than, than, than fruit. There's something more. Or if it has 15% saturated fat, and I don't think fruit has snack, maybe I will look further. The congressional intent behind the FDCA was to protect consumers all consumers, not just the educated, not just the well-informed, okay? Manufacturers need to package products and give enough information and use clear advertising to empower consumers to purchase what they really want to purchase and to protect their children. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. A few a couple points. First of all, a reasonable person standard. Let's talk about this. Where are these products located? They're not in the produce aisle. They're in the snack aisle. So right there, based off of the model that the opposing counsel is trying to put to you, a mother walks down the aisle where there's snack foods, not produce. But the reasonable person standard, again, as I've said, is not part of the CFR in the case here. And I'll direct your attention specifically to CFR 101.22i where it says, if food is one that is commonly expected to contain a characterizing food ingredient, in this case strawberries, if the food contains no such ingredient, the name of the characterizing flavor may be immediately preceded by the word natural and shall be immediately followed by the word flavored in letters not less than one half the height of the letters in the name of characterizing flavor. And an example cited in the federal rule, uh, excuse me, the uh, Code of Federal Regula Regulation is natural strawberry flavored shortcake or strawberry flavored shortcake. It's right there, Your <coughs> Honors. It's even the same fruit. The deference that should be given to the FDA is clear. They were given the authority to look at this issue and to promulgate rules to absorb all of the principles from the cases that were cited in plaintiff's brief. And they've done so and codified those principles in the CFR and the sections that were cited in our brief, and it operates as a strict liability regulation. You're either in compliance or you're not. And so to inject a reasonable person standard, I'd highlight the fact that opposing counsel said legislation takes time. And I believe what she's trying to do here is through four unelected officials impute a reasonable person standard which doesn't exist in the FDA and make everybody in this country accountable to it. That's simply not the democratic process that we follow in this country. And again, we would ask that the panel here today <coughs> affirms the lower court's decision. Thank you very much. All rise. The court will now take a five minutes. I want you to look at the law. I also want to comment uh, two quick points. The reasonable person standard. We kept coming back. What I found with both of your arguments, you kept coming back to the, your main points. You were saying you use a test that's used in food and drug law beyond the reasonable person standard, and that's the ignorant, unthinking consumer test. It's used in many cases. It's used especially in cosmetics, but it's used in food cases for those who buy products that want to lose weight, for weight control products. Because the court said, look, the consumer is really pathetic here. The consumer wants to buy the food roll, so for example, <laughs> lose weight. So we're changing the standard from reasonable to the unthinking ignorant consumer test. Some may argue with the words choice, ignorant. That's what the court said. The test is applied many times throughout in food and drug law. It's also applied in product regulation of food and drug law. So they're two valid tests. But what you kept doing, uh, Sam, was you kept coming back, which was good. You kept, uh, and then I think the judges asked some questions. I'll be interested to see what happens, and then we'll let you know what we decide. So if you'll reconvene for five minutes, and then one person will read the opinion of the slide.
All rise. The court is now in session. The justices have reached a decision. Thank you. Uh, this court has affirmed in part and denied in part the decision from the Northern District of California. Justices Verdi and Powers are going to read both parts of that. <coughs> This issue at first blush may seem inconsequential to find its way into the annals of our constitutional jurisprudence, but the issue it presents is of no small legal significance. We unanimously believe that the proper standard to use in determining whether a label is misleading is the reasonable consumer standard. The reasonable consumer standard is an appropriate co corollary and a logical extension of the congressional intent of 21 USA, USCA 343. Both the standard and congressional intent serve the dual purpose of protecting the consumer against misleading advertising. The statute provides the authorization to prevent misleading advertising and the reasonable consumer standard provides the proper standard in which to judge whether a consumer has been misled by advertising. The reasonable consumer standard is also fair to cons commercial interests because the advertising is not judged on the subject subjectivity of the indiv individual complainant. In their brief, General Mills cites Abruzzi versus Pasta and Cheese Incorporated. We find this case to be unpersuasive simply because the case involves two commercial enterprises involved in litigation against one another. Two commercial enterprises are bound to look at their commercial, at their competitor's advertising with a subjective eye. Therefore, in consumer cases, the proper standard to judge whether or not advertising is misleading is the reasonable consumer standard. The reasonable consumer standard must, nar must be narrowly tailored and applied to the only to the circumstances of a specific case. In Carrera versus Dreyer Food, Dreyer's Grind Ice Cream and Stewart versus Cadbury Adams uh, USA, the court refused to apply the reasonable consumer standard to ice cream and chewing gum. Our analysis focuses on 21 U.S. Code uh, Statute 343, which states, A food shall be deemed to be misbranded, false or misleading, if its labeling is false or misleading in any particular, or, in the case of a food to which Section 350 of this title applies, its advertising is false or misleading in a material respect, or its labeling is in violation of Section 350b2 of this title. Appellants must show that members of the public are likely to be, seen, be, likely to be deceived. We find that um, members of the public are not likely to be deceived, and um, therefore the advertising on the label of fruit by the foot is not misleading. Uh, we believe it's within uh, FDA's purview to change these statutes, and um, it is not uh, within our discretion to change the uh, statutory uh, construction. That concludes our opinion. <laughs> <laughs> All rise. Court is adjourned.